The Delisting of White Lake by Megan Brown Harm Polluted Damaged Hurting Suffering Disappointing Waste Chemicals Laws Improvement Helping Saving Healing Clean Beautiful Recovery It's a story of lessons learned, hard work, partnership, persistence, patience, and finally, restoration and recovery of a beloved lake, White Lake. White Lake is more than 2,500 acres of stunning natural beauty located in western Michigan, nestled between the White River and what locals call the Big Lake, Lake Michigan. It includes the quaint neighboring cities of Whitehall and Montague, as well as several rural scenic townships. The lake is part of the White River watershed, which ranges throughout three counties in western Michigan. The White River begins in north central Nuego County and flows southwest for 83 miles before it enters White Lake, between the two cities of Whitehall and Montague, and then Lake Michigan. It was once called White Lake the Beautiful, and with good reason. The lake's beauty and ample natural resources provided a special quality of life for both those who called the White Lake area home and those who would come to visit. The White Lake area was settled about 150 years ago during Michigan's logging era. The prospect of jobs and profit to be made brought people and businesses to the region, but small town living and an especially pleasing natural setting made the settlement permanent. Later on, generation after generation of visitors would find White Lake an ideal spot to vacation, and the area became known for its charming lakeside resorts. There was little heavy industry in the area's early years, although the Whitehall Leather Company, originally called Eagle Ottawa, had been a White Lake shoreline fixture since it opened in 1865, the first industry in Muskegon County. The company chose to locate on White Lake for the hemlock trees in the area and use the bark for tanning hides. The tannery provided jobs for hundreds of families, maintaining steady employment even through the Great Depression. But it had its problems. Years of dumping hides and wastes into the lake contributed to a growing problem of weeds. The tannery was also the source of strong and unpleasant odors. As far as the, the water, quality of the water, uh, people didn't say much about that because they were fishing and boating, oh. but the, the stench, that, that's what the big thing was. Dyes used in the tanning process turned the lake a reddish color at times. The use of chromium and other chemicals in the tanning process, beginning in the 1940s, resulted in the pollution of the lake bottom and the tannery property. This was not discovered and dealt with until years down the road. And I remember one of the first meetings involving this stuff was the Svensons came, uh, Charlie and his wife and some other people saying, you got to do something about this, the odor, the stink, the lake, uh, it's killing the business and, um, of the resort. The attitude was, we have to protect these jobs at all costs. And, um, you know, that was the, the attitude of the overwhelming members of the council. The landscape changed considerably in the 1950s when Progress brought chemical giants such as Hooker, Chemical, DuPont, and other companies to the area. It was just too bad that they didn't learn from that and went ahead with DuPont and uh, Hooker and stuff. People are going to learn, you know, stay away from the lake when it comes, or water, when it comes to uh, manufacturing stuff. The companies bought new residents many of them highly educated and hundreds of jobs. The influx of new residents spurred expansion of both the local school systems and catapulted the White Lake community into a new and prosperous era. But there was a hidden price to be paid for this progress. The chemical manufacturing era started out innocently enough. At first, Hooker Chemical was drawn to Montague because of the area's many salt caverns, a key ingredient to use to make caustic soda and chlorine, ingredients for making many basic chemical compounds. Shortly after, however, 
the company built a fine chemicals plant to put the chlorine to use. They began to make hexachlorocyclopentadiene, often called C56, which in turn was used to make pesticides such as Myrex and Chlordine. In the mid-1970s, area residents began to be increasingly concerned about chemical companies' activities. One evening, there was lots of chemical smells coming in our neighborhood. And so we called one of them immediately, one of our friends immediately. And, well, they asked there were emissions or something that they did at nighttime. And, and we were concerned, but we trusted them, and they assured us that it was safe. They lived here also. We moved down the spring of 75. Yes. In May. And uh, the water tasted terrible, and I thought, well, that's because of a new well. that They're pickling in the pipes, but it got worse. It started smelling like the back room of a dry cleaning establishment. And we got no help from any of the local people and everybody kept saying, it's Hooker, it's Hooker. So I hired Wynn Dahlstrom and we went after Hooker. And all we wanted was drinking water. So now so. I'd be like at the grocery store and you know, people would come up to me that worked at Hooker and say, well, I, you know, I'm really glad you're bringing this out. They can't, you know, they couldn't themselves because uh, they'd lose their job. And then there was some that didn't just keep it quiet. For three days prior to the time that I quit, they had let an eight inch line just spew forth hydrogen chloride and chlorine, C56 gas wastes, you know, into the atmosphere. The foreman that I was with that day, uh, we tried to patch it, but it was too profuse. We couldn't even come near to getting it stopped, and it just kept going. So I gave him my resignation on the basis of that and the way they had operated in the past, because generally it hadn't changed from the time I had started to the time I had left. After considerable community outcries and even charges of dumping from a company whistleblower, the state launched an investigation of Hooker Chemical in the late 1970s. One finding shocked the state and the community. 20,000 barrels of C-56 and other chemicals were found on the property, leaking from the plant onto the ground, into the groundwater, and eventually into the lake. I never heard of C-56 until I was sitting in a meeting of the Air Pollution Control Commission, and Marion Dawson, uh, one of the citizens from the area, came in complaining about that company and talking about what C-56 was. I came back to Lansing after that meeting, extremely concerned about what she'd said. Uh, began to talk to Dr. Truckin and Lee Jager and others within the executive branch, and that's what began our enforcement action. This was not a uh, an internally generated enforcement action. It came as a direct result of the citizens complaining about it. In 1985, White Lakes pollution problems landed it on an international list of 43 Great Lakes areas of concern. 14 of these toxic hotspots were in the state of Michigan, including White Lake. There were those early on, even before the AOC designation, that raised the alarm about the damage that was occurring to the lake. The picketing, the civil disobedience, and other activities were not always popular but it did bring the issue to the forefront. Next came the step when a group of citizens and the community in general began the long and difficult process of defining the problem and putting together programs to address those issues. What resulted over the years was a successful partnership between local, state, and federal agencies to clean up and restore White Lake to health. The local group the White Lake Public Advisory Council, or PAC, as it was called, was very fortunate to have the expert help of the Muskegon Conservation District. The conservation districts in Michigan are considered a local unit of state government, a subdivision of the state, um, and essentially acts as a local natural resource agency. And a lot of the focus in the past has been in the agricultural arena, but for Muskegon County, uh, because of all the lakes and streams, uh, watershed issues has really focused more on water quality, watershed, 
um, kind of the whole realm of natural resources. Many steps were taken to remove the eight impairments. In the late 1970s and the early 1980s, there were actions taken to help reduce pollution into White Lake and begin the restoration process. Discharges from the area chemical companies and the city sewage treatment plants were diverted out of the White Lake area into the new county wastewater treatment facility built for the area. Cleanups of several polluted sites such as Hooker Chemical were also begun. More cleanup was definitely needed, however. Investigation of the tannery site began in the mid-1990s. Polluted sediments in Tannery Bay and by the Hooker Chemical Outfall were removed. And after many studies, the tannery land site was cleaned up in 2011. With funds from the Federal Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, natural habitat was restored around White Lake at 10 public and private sites in 2013 including the former Hooker Chemical Shoreline property. Recreational access was improved at the public sites. Over several decades, cleanup was at the top of the agenda of countless public meetings and the focus was squarely fixed on meeting goals that would show the lake was restored. All of the problems or impairments identified for White Lake were addressed in a step-by-step -step scientific manner. By 2014, they had all been officially removed. Once all of the impairments were removed, the PAC worked with the state to delist White Lake as a Great Lakes area of concern. White Lake was officially delisted in October 2014. Well, thank you for coming tonight. And I'm Greg Munn. I'm chair of the uh, P White Lake Public Advisory Council. Right. And of course, <laughs> as much as anything, I'm the uh, MC tonight, making sure we try to stay on track and get everybody out on a timely fashion. But first, everybody that has an agenda, if you can take your ink pen and you know how you make a little carrot to add in words above, right behind White Lake, carrot, add in delisted and restored. and the historic occasion was marked with a big community celebration attended by local residents, area students, and elected officials at the local, state, and federal level. I do, look at the headlines in that beacon. <laughs> How about that? And then he just, just stole part of my thunder. I was going to tell you that delisting was coming up the end of this month or the first of next month. Yep. It's here. It's here. It's we got here. a present. We can really celebrate tonight. Yeah. Thank you. The timing of this uh, event tonight is unbelievable. I mean, I think you got to give the, the PAC, everybody that was worked so hard for this, a great hand. We're here today to celebrate the delisting of the lake from an International Joint Commission Area of Concern program. It's a monumental achievement, and to quote Mayor Hatch, it's a big deal. It is a big deal. It should lift the shroud from the community and let us enjoy the light. Well, and let me officially welcome you tonight to tonight's episode of Extreme Makeover, White Lake Edition. <laughs> Nobody's got anything on us, right? It is really a privilege to be a, a part of this and to have been able to lead the effort on the funding and to watch what all of you have done as volunteers and community leaders and elected officials to make this happen. Um, this is making history. As all the speakers have said, it's been a long time coming. It's been a group effort, everyone together private, public, uh, coalitions, everything you need to finally get a project like this done. It's not something that takes one person or two, it takes all of us to get to the time and the place where White Lake is here today. All of you around this room, even if your name hasn't been mentioned, you've had a role. You've had a role to play in getting uh, to where we are today. What does the acronym AOC stand for? Area of concern. White Lake, it's not your job to turn that acronym into something different. 
area of care. We are banking on you, banking on you, to make sure that we don't slide backwards in this very special place. Turn this place from an area of concern into an area of care starting here today. You know, we're not going to get on the area of concern list and work for another 22 years and then have another delisting party. So this is it. I'm glad you showed up. There's so many different uh, people that had a lot to do with this. You know, we have the Muskegon Conservation District. We've got the Office of the Great Lakes, the DQ, the EPA. But we have to go back to the Public Advisory Council and our local community leaders because this doesn't get done without the people who put their, put their heart and soul into it. And that's how these things get done. When my family moved here uh, a few years ago, my kids were, uh, gosh, they were babies almost at that point, I thought, this is a great community to raise our kids in, and just all the natural resources, the lakes and the lake shore, um, what a great thing. And then I learned a little bit more about the history and what the people of this community have been fighting for for such a long time. And it is just great to see all of this come to fruition and you know have this lake get cleaned up. A healthy lake is a healthy community in so many ways. Not just health-wise, but economically. I think that will start to change as well uh, as people will feel good about, about the lake and feel safe using it. This is the community's celebration. This is the community's moment. I cannot tell you how pleased, thrilled, joyful that we are that you felt as a community that what you had 20, 30, 40 years ago was unacceptable and that you took the hard road to say what I want to give to the future was not what was given to you. That is a testament to dedication and dissatisfaction with the status quo, but that is a call to say we get to, ter ter we get to determine our own future. You get to turn the page on this chapter. There's many, many more chapters to be written, but you know what the beautiful thing is? It's a beautifully blank page that you get to start to write in. Turn to each person that, you know, sitting next to you and tell them congratulations. We're done. We're delisted. So. Today the lake is restored to its natural beauty and can rightfully be called White Lake the Beautiful once again. We learned it's our lake and our responsibility to keep it clean. We are not done. We all need to do our part to keep White Lake safe and healthy. We've learned it's up to us to maintain and restore conditions to our most valuable natural resource. We are, and always will be, the watchdogs of White Lake the Beautiful. And looking back at it, I think it's, it's, it's very interesting how the attitude of the communities changed. Uh, and it was ugly at times. And there were some very, very uncomfortable moments, uh, things that happened. I think what was interesting is as this came out, people became aware of the situation and they accepted the fact that something had to be done about it. And it wasn't overnight, it wasn't easy, and uh, there were a lot of organizations and a lot of folks who worked very, very hard to educate the communities, to make them aware, bring them to the point that they've come to today.